It's going to be a really exciting uh, discussion tonight. We've got three fantastic people, fantastic women, here to speak with you tonight, and um, I'm really looking forward to a lively debate. So how things will go tonight is we'll have a bit of a short discussion, we'll put out some ideas, and then we want to hear from everybody in the audience. Um, let me uh, acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the place on which we meet today, the Aura people of the Gadigal Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Let me just deal with some housekeeping matters. Um, those of you that have joined us here before will know that we are videotaping and audiotaping tonight's session. That is because, unfortunately, we don't get out of Sydney enough and um, we'd really like the opportunity for people to not just hear our speakers tonight but to also hear the discussion. So please let me know if that's an issue for anybody. We'd like to have the uh, audio and video tapes up on our website so that people can uh, also enjoy these things and use them as podcasts so we set them up on our website. Um, you, you know the drill, but particularly because we're or um, we're doing the video tape. Would you please just check your mobile phones? I have mine on for very good professional reasons because we're waiting on a couple of people to come up. So if you could please check your phones, that would be great. Uh, we will have we'll rejoin after our discussion tonight for for more drinks and food. So please, if you're able to stay back, that would be great. Let me just take a, a minute to introduce the UTS Centre for Local Government. Um, we're hosting the event here tonight uh, with Walga and Alga, and we're very happy to, to be doing that. Um, the Centre for Local Government, we've been here for about 25 years. Um, those of you that don't know us or to, um, which means we haven't reached out enough, um, we have uh, a master's program in local government, a PhD program, a number of graduate certificates and graduate diplomas where anyone who's got an interest in studying in or about local government, please don't hesitate to be in touch with us. We've got lots of brochures out the back. We also run an external research and consultancy program. We do a lot of consultancy work with local government, in a, again, in and about local government all around the country. And we have an academic program where we, of course, are very interested in, in keeping up with the current debates in, in, uh, in, about local government and using that to underpin the work that we do. If you check out our websites, we've got lots of manuals, lots of brochures. We work very closely with the sector who drive our research program. So anything that you've got an interest or anything that you think we can be doing or we can make your lives easier, those of you that are working in local government, please don't uh, hesitate to be in touch, with you, uh, in touch with us. I'd like to particularly welcome tonight, we've got a number of people from the Japanese Centre of Local Government here, our colleagues from Clare. I'd like particularly to welcome the director of the centre, we have a number of colleagues here who are visiting us from Japan as well as some new members of staff of Claire, so you'll please be very welcome. We're very um, glad that you're interested in this particular topic. So let me now start out by welcoming <clears throat> a great friend of ours, a great, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the Honourable Margaret Reynolds. <clears throat> Margaret is a an adjunct professor with UTS, and she's the chairperson of the, uh, the Australian Centre of Excellence for Local Government Board. Margaret has a background in education and public policy. She was first elected to Townsville City Council in 1979. I don't know why people put that stuff in, in our bios. It's extremely disconcerting, I find. But she spent a number of years as a councillor uh, responsible for community and cultural development. In 1983, Margaret was elected as the first woman to represent the Australian Labor Party as a Senator for Queensland, and she remained in that position for 16 years. Bob Hawke appointed her the Minister for Local Government and Regional Development in 1987, and she held that portfolio for three years, together with that of the Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Status of Women, where she was responsible for bringing in and monitoring new anti-discrimination legislation. Since leaving Parliament, Margaret's done a few things. The most important, of course, is that she's the chair of our board. She's done a few other important national and international things. She's the, including the Australian Government representative on the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, the chair of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, the national president of the United Nations Association of Australia, and she's had a long-standing commitment to actively pursuing social justice and human rights. And I welcome Margaret to have a chat with you. Thank you very much indeed for the introduction and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the, uh, of the land on which we meet. 
and uh, welcome you all to uh, this discussion about empowering women in local government. Sometimes when I make uh, speeches like this, I think, oh dear, I've been saying the same thing for so many years. I worry about who's sitting in the audience because they might put their hands up and say, oh, Michael, don't tell that story, we've heard that one before. But uh, my husband this morning um, said, uh, what are you doing in Sydney again? And I said, empowering women in local government. And he sort of rolled his eyes and said, oh, that. that. And he said, uh, that one where you sing, I am woman, hear me roar. And I said, no, I have never sung that, well, not in public anyway. But uh, it's, it's very interesting to have had a long career, even if the 1979 is a little bit of a worry sometimes when it's mentioned. It's even more uh, difficult when uh, I'm, I remind people that uh, our firstborn turned 50 last year, and kind people say, you must have been a child bride. Uh, but uh, looking back over all those years of being involved in local government, I guess I say, the more things change, the more they stay the same, particularly in relation to empowering women and recognising the role that women play in decision making. And uh, Roberta, please stop me then. Yep. And uh, it's uh, lots of good things have happened over those years of, uh, that I've been watching uh, the role of women in local government, not just in this country, but in other countries as well. But every now and then, women talk to me about their particular experiences, and I roll my eyes and say, oh no, that couldn't still be happening, could it? But it does. Uh, there was the case of a young uh, woman mayor in, um, in Tasmania a few years ago, and she had her first child while she was, uh, she was uh, mayor of the, of the city. And uh, she didn't use childcare. She took her baby son to a number of local government functions. She didn't take him to council meetings or committee meetings uh, where she really had to concentrate. Uh, she arranged to leave him with, with uh, her family. But she was absolutely vilified. But she took her baby son to a, a variety of community events. I might say it wasn't the community that was vilifying her. It was uh, some of her colleagues and, and staff. And yet we all knew that if she had dared to hire a nanny or to use traditional childcare, she would have been equally vilified. And I guess that's where the challenge for us in empowering women uh, in decision making, and we're focusing on local government here of course, is the double standards that still apply. And I guess my, if, if there's one thing I'd like you to remember uh, from what I'm saying tonight, it's that if something is happening at council level that could only happen because it involves the women councillors or the woman mayor uh, and it couldn't possibly happen uh, to the other gender, it's time to speak up, it's time to be empowered. I found in my career in local government that I started out being very shy and tentative, some of you might find that hard to believe, but I walked in to sit at the council table I was about 42, and I thought, gosh, how did I get here? I can't do this. All these important men all around me, they will know so much more than me. So I wasn't quite shaking in my shoes, but I was quite nervous about my first meeting. And I sat, and I listened, and I looked, and I thought, oh, what are you worried about? <laughs> because the behaviour the behavior, uh, and the language and the uh, level of articulation was very ordinary. And I thought, oh, I can do that. And I think that, you know, this happens still to too many women. 
they, they are intim intimidated initially by the fact that something is very new and something that uh, is, is out of their, their comfort zone. And they, they think, oh, can I really cope with this? And of course they can. They can do it with, uh, with a great deal of ease and grace. But unfortunately, there are so many women out there in our communities who still think, oh, it's great that you were in local government. It's great that you went into the parliament. Uh, I couldn't do that. And I say, of course you could. Girls can do anything. Uh, but we still don't find that level of supreme confidence uh, in sections of, of our communities that we should find, I think. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be selected to go on a Leadership for Women course uh, at uh, Harvard a number of years ago. And uh, it was an interesting experience because we were women from around the world and we were asked to speak about why we were successful, whatever that means. And we all told, had to tell our story about why we were successful. And do you know, every one of us from very different cultures, we all attributed our success to other people. Families, friends, partners, mentors. We all said, oh, of course, and we used them, I did too. Of course, I was very lucky. I had you know, a mother who encouraged me. I had this opportunity. I had that opportunity. I was lucky that someone uh, suggested I go into local government. And uh, we all used that word luck or lucky, and we all used the experience of being our, our success being fostered by someone else. And when we finished, uh, the, uh, the woman who was taking the course, she said, she said uh, that was very interesting. She said, do you know, I did exactly the same exercise with a group of men from different cultures, same program actually, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and she said only two men out of about 30 attributed their success to someone else and used the word luck. Now, it's a few years ago since we did that, but uh, since I was involved in that. But every now and then, just to be cheeky, uh, if I have friends at, uh, for, for barbecue or dinner, I use that experience and I just uh, ask people, you know, why, why do they think they're good at their job or good at what they're currently doing? It still works. Try it sometime. So, on one hand, we're very tentative when we're going into a new situation, but on the other hand, we're very proud to acknowledge the role many men have played in our success. So, it's, it's a bit of a conundrum, and it's something that I think we really need to keep working on to encourage more women to have the self-confidence to go into Parliament or into local government, but also to be prepared to say, I'm good at this, I've got, uh, I've got this experience, I've got these qualifications, I can do this, and not necessarily use the word luck or use, uh, it's nice to acknowledge the people who've supported you, of course, but it is fascinating that women with qualifications uh, will not necessarily attribute their success to themselves. They are attributed uh, to, uh, to other people. I now am in the situation of uh, the work I'm, I'm doing is uh, working with uh, uh, Flinders University uh, as well, and we're evaluating the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And so one of the things that I'm also doing is talking about diversity in decision making. After many years of talking about uh, women in decision making, I'm also now talking about uh, the importance of women with uh, of women and men with different lived experience, and it may well be having a disability of some form 
being part of our community and exercising their right uh, to be involved in decision making because we miss out on so many experiences and skills by assuming that a certain cohort of people, and traditionally, of course, it's been men, uh, we miss that breadth of, of experience and insight in our, our public policy making. I'm also in the happy situation now of having a daughter who's gone into local government and a daughter who's gone uh, into uh, international development. And guess what? They both tell me stories all these years later that I say, no, that couldn't still be happening. Uh, that couldn't still be happening. Surely things have moved on uh, since the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s. Surely we're better than this. So I guess my, my message uh, to you here tonight is that we, there's a great deal we can celebrate uh, in this country and indeed internationally that women are taken much more seriously in their roles in decision making and elsewhere. And you know, that's a cause for celebration. But we can't relax. We have to assume that there's a great deal more to be done to encourage others to broaden that base. And this is particularly so with young people, and particularly so with marginalised people. And I'd, I'd count, and I hope they wouldn't be offended, but I'd count many of the, the people with the lived experience of disability in this area. Because to make good decisions, uh, you need to have some insight into what it would be like to have that capacity to either have the direct experience or to be able to put yourself in another's situation. And sadly, I hear most nights on the news, be it um, international, uh, state, uh, national or state or local, I hear the voices of people, not only um, men, some women too, I don't want to suggest that all women are paragons of virtue, because clearly we're not. But I do hear constantly from people who are in critical uh, decision-making roles about what is really, uh, what people are really experiencing at the community level, be it, be it uh, in the international area or be it in our own local communities. So please uh, enjoy the course, I know you will, and if you haven't thought about getting involved in local government yourself, uh, please do so, and do in fact encourage other women and um, young women in particular uh, to join all those great women who are making such a, a great con contribution. Thank you very much. And thanks very much. We'll, um, we'll hear plenty more stories uh, in the discussion time. It is my great pleasure uh, now to welcome Vicky Scott. Vicky is the President of the New South Wales Branch of the Australian Local Government Women's Association and a councillor with Gosford Council. Vicky's been a long-standing and passionate advocate for social justice and gender equity in New South Wales and nationally, and you're currently in your third term with Gosford City Council. She's a strong advocate for a local community and until recently Vicky was an active member of the Gosford High School PNC and is a life member of three local PNC associations. In the past she's also held an, an officer position with the New South Wales PNC Federation. You're on a bunch of committees. Oh, well, I won't list them all. Blah, 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 blah. It's a great pleasure to welcome you. I don't know how you get it all done. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Roberta. Uh, I'd first like to acknowledge original, the original inhabitants of the land on which we meet. Um, I think we should reflect on the lessons those people have for us in terms of community and the respect for the land we care for in local government. Now, I'm going to be reading from my notes because I'm not as clever as the others, maybe. Um, and there's so many of them. I noticed that it gave me five minutes to speak. Well, no. You can have longer. 
I'm taking on <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge the other speakers, as Associate Professor Roberta O'Brien, um, the Honorary Margaret Reynolds, and um, Nicole Campbell. And during World War II, uh, Gosford Council set a benchmark for its future. Four women were elected on the council. The council wasn't to meet that benchmark again until 2012 when again four women were elected from the council. That's four out of ten. So why did that happen? Well, the first time, obviously, uh, the blokes were away doing the, their service and the women stepped up as they did in many forms of community in those days. Um, the second time, 2012, was for various reasons. A very popular sporting personality uh, ran with a woman second on his ticket and he had plenty of money to spend on his campaign. Another woman was lucky to scrape in, even though her party put her down on the number four position. She just scraped in. The Greens are strong in putting women first on their ticket. And the fourth had been around for a couple of terms and was number two on a major party ticket. In this matter, Gosford is out of the ordinary. To have 40% women on council is very unusual. The average percentage of women on council in um, elected on councils throughout the country is 26%. So should Gosford bring the side relief, tick the box and say, it's all right, we've, we've achieved? I don't think so. Gosford has had only one female mayor over 20 years ago. It's not had a female deputy mayor, and nor has it has a, had a female general manager. It has had a, fa a handful of female directors. I guess we should be grateful. What Gosford does have, however, is a status of women committee consisting of, of uh, community members, staff and councillors. I want to reduce, introduce two of our community members here today, Audrey MacDonald and Rachel Webb, and they'll raise their hands. <laughs> Uh, the committee looks at gender and policy issues affecting staff and councillors and addresses social issues relevant <coughs> to the community. There was just a few weeks ago an occasion when uh, one of our male councillors flagged an item on the agenda for discussion and it was the minutes of the Status of Women Committee. When he was asked what his concern was, it was that the Women's Committee had been talking about nuclear warfare and maybe we really should stick to knitting. So, of course, he said the word knitting with a grin on his face because he'd probably been planning it for a week. <laughs> but there was an element of truth in that. So if we look around at 152 councils in New South Wales, we'll find a handful of councils which don't have women elected to council. We'll find councils, a few councils, which have female mayors, and I'd like to introduce um, Councillor Karen McEwen, who is the new Mayor of the um, And we'll find about 5% of councils which have a female general manager. In 1951, a small group of women who were elected as councillors from around Australia decided to form an organisation, a sisterhood if you like, of women on councils to encourage other women to take a step towards standing for election and to support existing women on councils. The Australian Local Government Women's Association was born and the state's four branches. And I'll now introduce some of um, our ALWA, Australian Local Government Women's Association, our ALWA Executive Committee, Again, Councillor Karen McEwen, Mayor of Penrith, Councillor Jackie Greenow from Penrith Council, Julie Griffiths, past councillor from Blacktown, um, and we're um, very pleased to have them here. They're all very experienced women on lo in local government. Alba New South Wales has been consistently campaigning for gender equity in local government for both elected officials and staff. We've done that in a variety of ways. At both federal and state level, Alba has run a program called 50-50 Gender Equity. This program identifies councils who can show at different levels programs and ideas to generate gender equity. These programs are rewarded with bronze, silver and gold awards. In 2010, local government celebrated the Year of Women in Local Government. The objective of this year 
was to highlight the role women play, advocate for cultural and attitudinal change, and encourage councils to set targets to increase the number of women both in elected positions and in management and leadership positions. Alba New South Wales worked solidly to highlight the year of women in local government. However, five years later, there is little change. It's almost as if the year of women in local government hadn't happened. Alba New South Wales has lobbied hard for progressive parental leave for staff in local government. Around the state, there are a number of councils where staff now enjoy family leave of up to 18 weeks on full pay. And I once got, almost got thrown out of a um, Shire conference um, for handing out um, forms on, on parental leave. That was fun. They called the police. The police came. And it was only um, the Premier of the day that saved us. Albert New South Wales has lobbied hard for progressive parental leave for staff in local government. Around the state, there are a number of councils where staff now enjoy family leave of up to 18 weeks on full pay. Did I just read that? Albert right. <laughs> Alba is also always willing to co-host with local councils forums held in their communities to encourage women to play a more active role in local government and to network with local women. An example is Yurubadala way down at Maruya. They asked us to go there to hold a forum prior to the last local government election. They had no women on council at the time and they had no women in the pointy end of um, council on the staff side. We held a memorable forum for about 80 women on a Friday evening and the next day we had our executive meeting there. Following the 2012 election, 30% of their councillors are women. Could be better, but it's much better than what they had. Our New South Wales is now lobbying for local councils to introduce policies which allow for family violence leave. The leave no one wants to have, but unfortunately a growing number of women and men uh, need to take. Prior to the last local government election in 2012, Alfred New South Wales proactively prepared a presentation for women on standing for election in local government. The state government decided to do a travelling show to each LGA to prepare, prepare candidates. This show included the Electoral Funding Authority and the State Election Authority. Alfred New South Wales asked and was permitted to join the travelling show. Our executive members, all volunteers, travelled up to four hours return trip to a number of, uh, of those meetings um, to address people and to try and help um, some of those women and many of the men. So we were always the last presentation of the evening. People were bored uh, and rightly so and, um, and tired and they often left before we got to speak. But those who stayed and many of the men actually said that too. Ours was always the best. Of course, I'm not biased. <laughs> uh, despite the good intentions of the public um, servants and the Alba volunteers, the <coughs> result of the election in 2012 did not reflect well on the effort made to put more women in local government. In general terms, there was little to no improvement in the numbers. While a handful of individual councils enjoyed some success, for example, Gosford and Eurobadella, the stats remained the same. Alba is very excited to have made an agreement with UTS and the Centre for Excellence in Local Government through the determination of Nicole Campbell that we fund this course. It's a first for us, particularly in regards to the cost. We have committed to subsidising the first two courses by $1,200 per person, a huge commi commitment for us. To help women out there get over the hurdle that is male domination at elections, we want to give new and current female candidates the opportunity to gain the knowledge they need to show that they will be confidently, confident elected representatives of their community. Nicole will talk about that and how, how participants, participants will be advantaged. Eleven years ago I was elected to Gosford City Council. I entered that chambers having attended only part of one meeting. Apart from that, I was pretty much a deer in headlights for four years. As a female member of a major political party, I've been asked to stand and I was lucky. I'm the first to admit the reason I got in was because I was number two on a major party ticket. Knowing what I know now, if I had the knowledge that this course will give, my initial role would have been much, much more successful. 
So why is it important to have gender equity in local government? Local government is often the training ground of future state and federal government politicians. If we want gender equity at those levels, we've got to start at local government. 52% of the population are females. There is a very real issue of equal representation. 60% of university graduates are women. While we don't need to have university education to go into local government, this statistic indicates that women are achieving academically, but not in terms of leadership opportunities. The benefits of women on boards are being recognised as economically and socially advantageous. Large corporations are not waiting for that mythical factor merit to reach a level playing field and are enforcing targeted employment policies to put more women around the table. Generally, like it or not, each gender brings with it different aspects. As a councillor in a male-dominated council, I've noticed a number of issues, a number of negative issues from a female point of view, such as attitude, talking over the top of you, bullying, lack of due consideration in decision making, um, disregard of women in mayoral elections, appointments and representational roles, and lack of emotional intelligence and so on. I have to say I am generalising here because if we take individuals um, person by person, that's going to be very different. I want to plug ALGRA membership. ALGRA New South Wales holds an annual conference, the next of which is in Gunnedah in March 2016. Our members are elective representatives and staff members, and we go to great efforts to provide a conference which has something for everyone. A major advantage for me over the last 11 years has been my ALGRA membership. The networking at conferences each year is invaluable and is unique to these delegates. I always knew help was just a telephone call away and I built up a rapport with women from a variety of councils across the state. It's given me a much broader view of local government than my fellow councillors were able to take. I feel strongly that empowering women in local government is the best thing ALGRA can do right now, not only for women in local government, but also for the community at large. Alvin New South Wales is very excited about this course. We thank the Centre for Excellence in Local Government and the UTS. In particular, we acknowledge the help that Nicole Campbell has given us above and beyond her duty in bringing this partnership together. And as a consequence of this course and the commitment of the future participants, we look forward to the next and larger, much larger intake of empowered female councillors in local government. We don't want all the seats at the table. We just want half of them. <laughs> and the opportunity to team up with men on council to achieve great things. And Margaret was talking about how things haven't changed much. I would hope we're going to bring about some change um, in, in um, the way that we elect women and the way that we work together, um, men and women work together. There's a little boy down the back of the room, he was 15 months old. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if when he's 35, he can um, work together with women as an, as an equal on local government? Thank you. Thanks very much, Vicky. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to uh, now introduce uh, Nicole Campbell. Nicole is a program manager here at the centre. Uh, prior to joining UTS uh, Centre for Local Government, she worked for uh, 20 years at the senior level in New South Wales State Government and for more than eight years as an elected uh, local government representative. <clears throat> I mean, Nicole is, passionate, is a passionate advocate for gender equity and has championed policy reforms to acceler accelerate gender balanced decision making at local, state and federal levels. She's been instrumental, we've already heard that, in developing the, the Empowering Women in Local Government program. She's here to talk with you about that. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, well, thank you, Roberta. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Vicky. Um, I, they're far too modest, these people, because they've actually all had a very significant role in developing this, uh, this program. Um, I have to say I'm absolutely delighted to be launching, uh, be part of this launch. Uh, this is something that ALGA uh, has been thinking about trying to do for about the last decade. So it is just absolute uh, delight to be involved with, with ALGA in terms of the program. So 
I'm going to take you through uh, a couple of things. So uh, Roberta's talked a little bit about the centre, um, and uh, you know Margaret's talked about um, you know the inequity in terms of the representation of women in, in public life, and uh, Vicky's uh, also shared some of. Uh, the history of ALBA, so I'll rip through that part of my presentation pretty quickly uh, and get on to actually what is the Empowering Women in Local Government program. So, I've just said that. Right, so this is just, uh, as I said, just a snapshot about the centre. It's been around for about 25 years. We are recognised nationally as the premier research uh, centre for um, uh, local government. And uh, we work across Australia. We also do a lot of work internationally with, uh, with local governments overseas. Uh, Roberta's talked about our, our teaching programs and our postgraduate awards. Uh, interestingly, the idea for this program came out of another program that we established in 2013 called the Elected Members Program, and we do that in conjunction with a number of partners. And, uh, and that was where we got the idea of actually thinking about, well, why don't we do something to support women uh, who are considering running for local government? So it's had a reasonable germination. Um, Alba, I think he's talked about Alba. I've just put this slide up here because I know you all run to your websites and, uh, and um, look them up because they are a fantastic organisation. Certainly as a councillor myself, uh, they were an enormous uh, source of support and um, peer-to-peer -peer networking for, for me as an elected representative. So anyone who's interested in local government needs to connect to Alba. They're just a great group of women. So we talked a little bit about stats um, in, uh, in Margaret's presentation and Vicky alluded to it as well. Uh, in federal parliament, you know, in the House of Reps, 27%, a little bit higher in the Senate, um, and only five, five women in the Cabinet. Um, that, Change obviously uh, <laughs> recently. Um, New South Wales, you know, Legislative Assembly, it's about 21%, which is pretty appalling. 31% in the Legislative Council, and uh, as Vicky mentioned, about 20 27% of uh, of women in local government uh, are council laws, and of that 27%, about 23%. Are, uh, are mayors and uh, women GMs are quite thin on the ground, so about seven percent. And obviously, that does not reflect the demographic of, uh, of the gender in our population. So, why are women underrepresented? Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of um, rhetoric that's thrown around, usually by um, can I suggest uninformed men about you know women just not being interested or needing to look after families, but actually the nature of the electoral system is biased against um, you know, the active participation by women. We also have uh, quite a patriarchal approach in terms of established major political parties. Um, as was mentioned, the Greens are a political party that uh, does have quite a progressive approach in terms of pushing, uh, pushing women, and that is not um, uh, you know, as obvious in some of the other established parties. Um, the, I'm a member of the Australian Labor Party, and we certainly do have uh, loading systems and affirmative action um, uh, approaches, but um, there's certainly uh, every woman in the Labor Party would have a story about being bumped aside for a bloke. So, in terms of New South Wales and, and local government, you know, local government's a massive space. We've got 152 councils in New South Wales and over 1,500 councillors. The sector itself employs over 50,000 people and has a massive infrastructure um, base of $89 billion. So we spend you know, about $9.5 billion a year. Um, so that's a significant sector. It's a significant sector for employment and also for political representation. And uh, all of you here will know the, uh, the fundamental services of, uh, of local government. It goes far beyond roads, rates and rubbish. Um, and uh, if anyone's interested in exploring service delivery with us, we're always happy to talk to you. We did a, um, a snapshot, we've been looking, the centre's actually been looking at some research in terms of the representation of, uh, of women in local government. So this is sourced from the 2010 survey of the women in local government uh, to look at where the women are. And so as you can see again, you know, pretty poor stats. So if you looked at uh, the total involved, you could say, well, it's 50%. That's all right. We're at 50%. But when you actually look at the proportion of women that are involved in senior leadership positions, either within the, um, you know, as elected representatives or in the senior management structure of council organisations, you can see that statistic is quite alarmingly low. So again, looking at um, uh, a piece of research that, uh, that the centre actually just completed earlier this year, um, we started looking at 
what kind of roles women have in, um, in, lo in the local government workforce. And again, the statistics tell an interesting story. You know, um, overwhelmingly men are represented in engineering and infrastructure and women in human and community services and, uh, and also, you know, the corporate services and governance, which I seem to have repeated twice in this slide because I must have thought it was very, very important. Um, so it's, you know, I mean, again, you're looking at very, very um, uh, male-dominated um, parts of the council as an organisation. It is unusual to see a, um, a woman who is the, um, the, the director of engineering. So there was another piece of research done, Hutchison Walker and Hazel McKenzie in 2014, and it was looking at that second tier management uh, of, uh, of managers in Western Australia. And it's a really, really interesting survey. So it did find, uh, again, not unsurprisingly, predominance of men at senior levels, a very masculinised style of uh, you know, the way people speak with each other within the council organisation and how they interface with the council laws. Um, and, uh, the interesting thing, um, which I think is, is something to keep in mind in terms of New South Wales, was that there was a gender bias in terms of selecting a CEO, uh, and uh, you know that appointment is actually made by the elected representative. So you kind of got the odds stacked against you if you've got a council full of blokes and uh, you're uh, you're somebody who aspires to be a general manager. The other thing that is you know concerning uh, to me is um, the idea that actually. You've got to co-opt women to adopt that masculinised culture. If you've got, you know, if you want to actually advance, then you've got to adopt those kinds of, um, of behavioural attributes to to get on. And that's certainly something that we should we should all challenge. Don't ask me why this thing's coming out in different orders, but anyway, there we go. Okay, so recent research. In fact, I think uh, just actually um, accepted the publication. I think just the other day. Um, on accidental executives. So this is another piece of interesting research on uh, some general managers and looking at you know um, where they come from and their career experience before entering local government. And it was extraordinary that um, uh, of the um, the general managers surveyed, women generally had had a position outside local government. Uh, a lot of the men had fallen into the role, started off as a clerk and worked their way up the uh, the food chain. So uh, it was very interesting in terms of uh, the research indicated systemic biases of age and gender in New South Wales local government. So we're not just making this stuff up. So why do we care about gender equity in decision making? We actually want, Vicky said, you know, we don't want all the table, we just want half of it, okay? Women and men working together as equals, and that provides a broader perspective, and that actually makes you, uh, helps you make better decisions. It's a more realistic uh, representation of the demographic, and it makes good business sense, because it opens up opportunities. It opens up the opportunity to have conversations that if you are actually just a, um, you know, a wholly um, male council that, uh, that you might not actually think of uh, of reaching out to organisations where um, where there are a lot of women in, you know involved. Uh, the need to focus on community and social infrastructure, family support services, playgrounds, childcare, children's services. These things can actually be um, uh, say underdone in councils where you don't have good representation of of women, and that's because the overwhelming demographic of councillors, certainly in New South Wales is a retired or semi-retired Anglo-Saxon male who, uh, whilst might have been a very you know, hands-on parent at that time, hasn't actually been concerned with, uh, with raising a family for several decades. So it's not to say that these men don't think about these things, they're just not front of mind. And that's where having women, particularly of different ages and particularly childbearing ages, is really, really important in local government. Okay, so our program. So Vicky's talked about you know this uh, this partnership. Um, this actually came about. It was Alba's idea, and I absolutely said yes. Let's do this. So when we talked about uh, Vicky talked about what we did in 2012, and so we did this travelling roadshow. We went around to lots of different local government councils, and we did our presentation at the end of the excruciatingly boring um, electoral funding authority presentation, and. We realised afterwards when we were talking about you know, how it had gone, we thought it was great that we'd actually made that significant effort and it really was hard work. Um, but we didn't see the return in terms of the numbers of women nominating for council and we realised that we needed a much longer lead time. We actually need to nurture uh, women as they go through a training program. We need to actually give the women the confidence to say, you know what, I can actually do this role. 
um, you know, that there's actually, there's no difference to, uh, to the, the, the men that are on council than the women that could be on council. And so we decided that running a stage training program would be a really exciting opportunity and to get in early enough that women would have these skill sets before it's actually time to nominate. So that's why we're launching tonight which is about a year out from, uh, from the next uh, council election. So we're going to do a mix of face-to-face -face and online lectures. Um, it's a six-day study commitment, so of that there's three and a half days face-to-face -face and two and a half days online content. It's actually, this first course is going to be hosted by um, Strathfield Council, which is wonderful. And uh, our second course, I'm delighted to announce that uh, one of uh, Karen McEwen's first decisions as mayor was to um, announce that the second course will be hosted by Penrith Council. So thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. So our three modules, we're going to talk about local government in context, personal and professional leadership skills, and campaigning logistics. Because it's all very well to you know read the Local Government Act, um, but if you're actually trying to think about, well, I've never run a campaign before. You know, what do I actually have to do? What do I need to do? Uh, those kinds of, of um, toolkits, if you like, and resources are not often visible, um, and particularly not often visible to women. So that's why we decided we're going to make this a course that covers, you know, um, uh, context and theory. Um, and talks about leadership, but also gives you the mechanics for actually how you go out and run a successful campaign. So as I said, the first module, what is local government? Understanding the language. Uh, those of us who work in the sector or have been involved with the sector would all know, and we're all guilty of it, of talking in jargon. And if you are not in the sector but interested in becoming a councillor, you usually spend the first year um, thinking, what the hell is a DCP? Um, we're also going to have a really good look at ethics and governance and uh, as you know, um, local government is overrepresented unfortunately in investigations by uh, the ICAC um, and so we want to actually look at that and uh, you know, have a look at um, governance mechanisms and, and the kind of behaviours that we actually expect of our elected representatives. Uh, obviously, we'll be looking at um, some of the research on gender equity in local government decision making. We're going to look at some of the key instruments that councils use in New South Wales, and in particular the Community Strategic Plan. So this is actually the vehicle that will drive the priorities for the council for uh, you know its next 10 years. So getting people's heads around that, um, it's a fantastic campaigning tool, so we'll be talking a bit about that. Um, talking about working with your communities and connecting to those community organisations, how to actually network and, uh, and get into those various groups, and the political interface before and after elections. And in that regard, I'm talking about uh, a political interface across the levels of government and across political parties, because what you work out really, really fast as a local government councillor um, is that if you're not prepared to actually broaden your base and broaden your conversation to include people who perhaps aren't from your, you know, uh, your political party, it, you're, gonna get, uh, you're not going to get a lot done and you're, um, uh, you'll get a lot more done if you actually work collaboratively. So our second module is going to focus on leadership, so both from a professional sense and also a personal sense. So we're going to look at you know, the foundations of leadership, uh, the difference between managing and leading, um, leadership skills, emotional intelligence, understanding how to work with people, understanding how people's personalities interface, um, leading for the community, so community-led governance models and how to actually harness community momentum, developing, uh, developing leadership, understanding your personal values and your capabilities, you know, what are you going to bring to, uh, to the table in terms of an elected representative, how do you actually want to define your local government career, and leadership approaches as they relate specifically to local government. And the third module is, uh, is about getting elected. It is wonderful to understand the theory and wonderful to build up our leadership skills, but actually what we want is women in those chairs around the table at local government. So, you know, why are you running? Understanding what your campaign theme is, building your narrative, understanding how to present yourself publicly in terms of an image, getting connected, understanding how to interface with the media, uh, business organisations, community organisations, people that can actually help and support you in your campaign. And we did organise those fireworks. I'm very pleased about the fireworks. Yeah, that's the moment. Um, and, and a really important part of the campaign also, though, is actually planning for that period in the lead up to the election. So the actual mechanics, um, understanding how to set up a campaign plan, understanding how the voting system works, how many votes you have to get to get elected, 
understanding um, the influence now is certainly very significant increase in the use of social media for uh, political activism and community, um, community activism. Looking at pre-polling, looking at election data logistics, understanding how to interpret the results and wrapping up your campaign. And of course, after everybody does this course, they're going to be elected, because I know they will. Uh, and then we're going to talk, you know, okay, well, next steps? You know, what's your, uh, what's your plan as an elected representative? So um, this course is aimed at three cohorts, women that aspire to run for local government, so haven't run before, women who are existing councillors, uh, but want to actually strengthen their uh, skill set and, and, and you know, articulate perhaps in a, um, a stronger way the contribution they want to make in terms of their local government career. But this course is also equally relevant to women who are working within the local government sector. So ALPA looks at elected representatives but also equally at staff. And so this is also an opportunity for people who are aspiring to senior leadership positions in the local government sector because a lot of the communication, um, you know, the communication, a lot of the leadership skills and everything like that is very, very relevant to both staff and aspiring elected representatives. So I'm going to talk about cost because um, the only reason this course is being held is because of very significant decision that our World New South Wales made uh, to heavily subsidise this course. It is really quite extraordinarily generous. Uh, so it's $600. And uh, that does represent, um, I think Vicky quoted the figure of um, 1,200. Actually, it's closer. To, it's closer to $2,000. Uh, so this first course kicks off in Strathfield on the 23rd of October. There are 20 places. It is starting to fill up. So if people are interested, they need to uh, to enrol soon. And one of the things that uh, is really important about this course is it actually gives you a formal qualification. It puts you on a path to postgraduate study. So. People who successfully complete the course, and there are assessment pieces associated with the course, um, will be eligible for um, recognition of prior learning in the centre's uh, graduate certificate in local government leadership, or indeed our the master's program that the uh, that the centre runs. So, you know, this is a pathway. The Minister for Local Government has talked a lot about fit for the future. There's a lot of rhetoric about being fit for the future, well this is actually about making sure that we are empowering women to actually stand up and say, I'm not only am I going to nominate, but I'm going to get elected and I'm going to make a contribution to my community. So our aim is to try and get an, at least 60 to 70 women nominated for local government and let's hope that we get at least half of those elected. I should say that we have had discussions with Minister Toole about the importance of this program and, uh, and we have suggested that he consider um, you know, augmenting the opportunity for us to run additional courses. So ALBA has funded the first two courses and we are actually now looking to the New South Wales Government to, uh, to match the commitment of the Australian Local Government uh, Women's Association and UTSC of Local Government in empowering women in local government. Thanks very much. Nicole, <clears throat> if I could get some time speaking up to the stage, and um, as I said, we organise those fireworks, so it's fabulous to, to be here for uh, the launch of, of the program. Um, questions, comments, please, I'd like very much to hear from you, we've got a microphone here, we do this in part because, of course, I mentioned earlier, we uh, record these sessions, so we want everyone to hear uh, your good questions and discussion as well. So, who's going to start us up? It's always hard to get people started, and then it's always hard to get people stopped at the end. So, <laughs> who'd like to get us started? Not a, not untypical for an audience for the women. Come on, there's a lot of councillors in this room who are used to current or former. Welcome, please introduce yourself. I'm a former councillor yes. mayor uh, and a member of of one. Um, but I'm looking at it. So, this is more. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I mean, you know, as, as the speaker spoke, I was reflecting back on my experiences and uh, the local headline when I first got elected said, housewife becomes mayor. <laughs> 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 I'm a lousy housekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> and the attitude of the, of the senior staff when I met them first was that she knows nothing. You know, no finance, nothing. I was actually flabbergasted uh, by that. I found it astonishing. Um, and and I, um, the impression I got was that, in fact, local government was, this is my impression, local government was way behind 
all sorts of other organisations in, in relation to their attitudes and views of the world, etc., etc. But I was shocked by the statistic about the staffing. I know, I mean, the politics of, you know, political parties, you know, that's one issue and, and, and a, a, a dynamic that goes on there. But I was absolutely appalled by the, the level of the numbers that in terms of the senior staff for, for women in local government. I find that quite shocking. And uh, the emphasis, because I remember that when I first got elected, was the emphasis on engineering <laughs> qualifications. <laughs> oh my God, they're all engineers. Um, and you know what kind of language they speak, you know, they speak a whole other language. Um, and I just thought that added into that, is there something, and this may be a conversation offline, something to do in terms of somehow buying into, at an earlier stage, particularly for young women, girls, young women, at, even if it's primary school or, or high school, of buying in there and getting something in there about raising their consciousness about uh, careers and, and jobs and activities around um, the kinds of occupations that of the future, mm -hmm. which are valuable to local government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a microphone there. I can turn it on for you. But thank you. Welcome any comments or, or questions. Thanks, Maura. Any other comments or thoughts from Hayden or, or well, Walker? And I will, I will turn on the air conditioning in a minute, and they will follow the ring as soon as I get up. Yeah, that button at the back, if you could, sir. Heather, hi. Heather. Heather. Hello. Heather. I'm Heather. Yeah. Come on, Heather. You can introduce yourself. Heather, proudly from Penrith City Council, um, next to Blacktown. <laughs> <laughs> Grew up in Blacktown. <laughs> um, oh, I'm not a councillor, I'm a, a staff member, an aspiring leader in local government. Um, yeah, I was a bit shocked. Oh, well, actually, I'm not shocked because I've heard that stuff before, but it continues to shock me. It's not really okay. So I wonder if the panel have any advice for um, women who are aspiring to leadership in, um, as staff members within local government about, um, I don't know, how we can positively discriminate <laughs> to change that. Um, and the other thing, which I think is also a question, I I've been really inspired recently by the work of Roxane Gay, um, who wrote Bad Feminist, um, and in the last few days um, watched a, a TEDx clip by, sorry I'm looking for her name, Melody, da, 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 da. look at your phone in the middle of talking, Melody Hobson, who um, did a TEDx um, talk recently. Uh, where she talked about being colour brave. Um, and one of the things, I guess the other things that I see in local government is that there's a lot of us who are white. Um, so I guess I, I've been thinking a lot about how to progress as a woman, but also how to um, positively discriminate and, and take a proactive stance around um, trying to support women of colour in local government particularly. I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. That's your right, Heather's doing our graduate program. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's, that's all right. right. That's all right. Who'd like to say something on that? Yes. On the panel, please. Uh, yes, look, I guess when it comes to uh, either getting women elected or getting women appointed at more senior levels in the, uh, in, within council, it's a question of which comes first. Because women supporting women at the uh, at the administrative level and the professional level, you know that's incredibly important. But often you need the leadership on council uh, through the you know the mayor and the councillors. I mean, in back in 1979, I used to make myself very unpopular because whenever we discussed getting a new person for a particular position, that's the the men around the table would say. Oh yes, we've got you know we've got some really good chaps you know or works coming coming in, and I'd say any women, and they'd look at me. You can imagine in 1979, and so gradually the the language was they'd be talking works, and I'd just quietly say all woman, all woman, all woman, and then it we went into we um, I actually initiated the appointment of the first community relations, indigenous community relations officer in Townsville. And, you know, when I first suggested it, uh, someone who was quite supportive of me said, oh, 
You'll never get that. If you want that, you better go to Melbourne or Sydney. You'll never get it in Townsville. But we got it within 12 months. Uh, but initially, you know, appoint an Indigenous community relations person in Townsville in 1981, I think it would have been, um, was, was just not on, on the agenda. But also, uh, just final point about, about um, uh, council staff, when I was in local government, and I'm sure you'll tell me, sadly, it's the same, the, the differential pay and differential attitudes to, to people who professionally should have been at the same level. For instance, um, I was very friendly with the city librarian, who, guess what, was female. And uh, she was a magnificent librarian, especially for, at that time, she took, you know, she took books out to the prison and, and uh, talking books to old people's homes. And, you know, she was really innovative. And uh, one day I saw her struggling with all these books uh, in cartons and the one that just collapsed. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, oh, I'm off to so-and-so to deliver the, the um, library service. And I said, well, you need a proper vehicle, you know. All the male senior staff at her level had council vehicles. She was using her own car, and many of them, you know, only drove them to and from work anyway. But she was actually proactive out there delivering uh, library resources to a whole range of, of different communities. She was using her own car. And I took it up at the next council meeting and said, look, this is, you know, this is outrageous. She's at the same level. And of course, by then I discovered that her salary was here and engineers were up there. And uh, I, I didn't, you know, that was one of my many failures. I never got her uh, a vehicle, a vehicle of, of uh, the council uh, initiated to recognise the good work she was doing. So, <coughs> So that's another area where you really have to have your elected representatives to, I mean, council staff will, will of course, do what they can within their um, union and different, different um, ways in which they can influence. But you need your women on council and men who see the inequity uh, in differential treatment. Um, Heather, the other thing that I think about, just to come back to your question about how do we encourage and empower uh, people of colour to think about, you know, um, either getting involved either within the sector as a staff member or standing for public office, this course offers a great uh, conversation starting point for everyone who's here tonight to go out and talk to three people. Um, you know, so go to the, um, uh, the local... Um, you know, migrant centre in uh, in your LGA, and you've certainly got a very diverse community out in Penrith. Um, go and talk to some of those established uh, cultural groups that are out there, and say, look, there's a course here that um, that is available, and uh, and it is about actually supporting women. It's about supporting women not only within the sector, but as I said, in in um, uh, you know, as elected representatives. And funnily enough, I was talking to um, some state parliamentarians about the program last week, and they were saying, well, hell, can we come? You know, they said, well, there's nothing here for us. Everybody just expects once you get elected, you know everything. So whilst the focus of this program is local government, uh, the leadership lessons and, you know, the communication and the interface and you know, all of those kinds of things are equally relevant. So, um, so I'm saying it's about empowering women, the title is empowering women in local government, but if you know good women out there, uh, either working in the community or in other, you know, other parts of uh, political life, then get in touch with them and say, let's, let's get involved in this and let's work together. Thank you. Julie Griffiths. Um, my, it's not a question, it's more a statement. I, I, I kind of believe that for women to come on board at your local level, it brings totally different dynamics around uh, beliefs. I mean, when I went there, my passion's around childcare. Um, Blacktown and Penrith are top in the state. Uh, Penrith 
Um, last count was 44 centres, uh, 300, uh, 220 staff. Blacktown was um, 36 centres and 250. Now, that's... It's incredibly impressive. Yeah, it, exactly. And you've got councils at the moment talking about opting out. Um, my issue is that um, these are services that councils have delivered for years in, in the community. And I find that women bring that to the table where, as stated by previous speakers here tonight, roads, rates and rubbish have been on the agenda, not just at council level, but also local government New South Wales level, because that's what they seem to think is core business. Times have changed. And the only way change will happen is by women coming to the table and, and ensuring that these services are delivered to the community, including the domestic violence, including the women's refuges, and as support services within local communities because we make a difference. And to make a difference, we have to be there. Mm, indeed. Here, here, thank you. Yes, um, sorry. No, just no. very quickly, um, if over a number of years now, I've been summing up local government in three words, male, star, and pale. Um, and I noticed a Sydney Morning Herald um, journalist picked did up. You get, did you get picked up? You did, you get, did you get... Um, no, it wasn't attributed. It wasn't attributed. No, no, it wasn't attributed. But anyway, um, but can I say, uh, I decided very early on, uh, one way that I thought I could make a difference, certainly at a staff level, was to have myself ensconced onto the senior staff um, committee for um, appointments um, to council. Yeah. So um, I, I did that. Jackie's also uh, there at the senior staff committee level as well as a councillor that gets to um, interview and, and do these things. But can I say I was very, very disappointed when we were advertising for our last general manager in that we did not get one female applicant. We're talking, you know, we're a large council. We're a very large council. We're a class 1A council. So you're talking, um, the top job is in excess of $250,000, like, you know, northwards of that sum. And I, and I was very, very upset that, you know, there was not, not a woman out in the market who, you know, could have for, for, yeah. for that. And I know there are some very talented women out there. Um, just one other observation I would make in that um, I, I don't know how you fix this and I'd be interested in, in certainly what the panel thinks here in that it seems when a woman applies for a job she feels she must tick all the essential criteria and at least have most of the desirable criteria. However, when a male goes for a job they will look at the essential criteria and go, oh, I sort of got that, and I uh, possibly got that one, and that'll get me over the line, so I'll apply for it. I, I don't know whether it's the mindset, but that just is an observation on my part, and I would just be interested to see what the panel thinks on that. Thank, no, thanks very much. Yeah, we do study at uh, UNSW 25 years ago on women and promotion, and well, it was exactly the same thing. Women had to have absolutely every single thing ticked off before they applied. The blokes had given a go a couple of years earlier and they were really ready. But the outcome was women got promoted. When they applied, they got promoted at a much higher rate. In fact, it was all it was like 80 or 90%. And the blokes got knocked back about 50% of the time. But it's just the idea of, well, I'm not close. I'll give it a go. Yes. Oh, sorry, you've got one there, but yeah. comments on, on that? I, I, t I totally agree. That's what I was really saying about, you know, self-confidence and the different ways in, in which women approach and use their self-awareness, their self-knowledge, their emotional intelligence. And, you know, sometimes we're too honest for our own good. Uh, so, um, I mean, of course, you can go to the other extreme and you know, a woman could apply for something that she's totally, you know, not ready uh, to do. But um, that certainly happens. And I mean, it happens, it happens very much at the state and federal parliamentary level. You know, the, these people who nominate uh, for particular positions, uh, we won't mention any names, of course, but, you know... The pre-selection squirmish being referred to. Yes. Yeah, I know. Yes. But, you know, you, they don't even pretend sometimes that they've got the community backing, the experience, the interest, the knowledge of 
what is involved in being a representative or indeed a, a, a senator, as a case in point in Tasmania. Watch Q and A next week. Uh, but uh, sorry, that I shouldn't advertise today. Uh, but uh, no, look, you're a, you're absolutely right, and it just needs many more of us to speak up and speak out and remind people of where we've come from, what we have achieved uh, with so many more women in local government, both professionally as uh, elected or, or staff, but there's still just so much more to do. Apart from the awesome women in the audience and the awesome women on the panel, we've got Donna Rigo, who's the CEO of Local Government New South Wales, another awesome yeah. woman here tonight. And you slipped in under my radar. I knew you would have mentioned earlier. Welcome, Donna. Go ahead. No. Oh, hi. My name's Anne-Marie Elias. I'm a, an associate of the Centre for Local Government and I'll be working on the course running the campaigning arm. And I think it's a lot more than just childcare that women bring. Women bring diversity. They bring collaboration which is not in the psyche of men. So you ask a woman to think of a problem and they'll be reaching out to their network. And I think that's what we have to do. And I love that you, Nicole, have said that this isn't just about women that want to aspire to elected positions. This is, you know, I would love to see women that have potential that just want to know how to have their views represented. And I, I love the way the course has been designed. I think it is absolutely spot on. I have not been an elected official, but I have been a staffer, starting with Clyde Holding at the age of 21 back in 1988. And I've gone both Labor and Liberal, State and Federal, and it's just really sad because I know that the women who are the staffers aren't even getting up to Chief of Staff level as well. So it's a problem across industries, but I'm really excited about the potential of this course that is really about empowering women to be advocates and also to start, you know, building the social capital around them so that when they choose to do something, they've got a community of women like us who will be participating in the program that you can reach out to to say, oh my God, I really think I'd like to apply for the job, but no, 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 I'm not going to. You'll have a hundred women on your doorstep saying, okay, let's get that application in. Thanks very much. I just want to go back to uh, Karen brought something up about um, employment panels, interview panels. The last time I was on an interview panel was three years ago. Um, I was there because the council was told they had to have a woman on the panel. <laughs> and the reason they had to have a woman on the panel was um, because the women who were being interviewed might feel nervous. And really, it was a very high level job. Um, nobody's going to apply for that if they, uh, if they don't feel confident in it. Uh, so we, we had the panel, we had the interview, we had two really, really competent women apply and a number of men, most of whom were very competent men as well. Um, but being the only woman on the panel, with about four, uh, four men, the, uh, the decision was made at the end of the, the um, session, uh, just on the word, well, no, made my decision, that's it. And I said, can we not discuss each one and look at how we feel about them individually? No, made my decision. And that's how that person was employed um, by council with no depth to it, no understanding of how we could work with that per person. And I just think that's, and whether or not that person is the right person for the job has little to do with it. It's just that it could have been decided a whole lot healthier. And I think that's a, what I've found in this term with four women on council is that we're the ones that want to delve into things a little more. We want to talk about it a little more and say, well, hang on, what if we try this? Because that's not working and we could go there. Um, and we've achieved um, considerable success and we're all politically different. We come from, all four of us represent the four corners of the political stream. And sometimes we don't get on. Um, but we work together when it's something really serious. And, 
and the, the, uh, the city is starting to notice that. Even though we don't have the votes, we can't. I, we had a mayoral election last week. Um, two of us, two of the women, myself and another one, decided that there was no candidate that we felt uh, was worthy of being deputy <coughs> mayor, because all the candidates are men, of course. Um, so we abstained, we were told we had to leave the room, so we left the room. Um, it didn't matter to us which one of those men got the job because we knew that there were better people in the room that could have done it. There were at least four better people in the room that could have done it. Yeah. Thank you. Let's, let's just, um, any further questions or comments? I think it would be great to continue this discussion informally. I might just ask Nicole to say a couple of concluding remarks. Please join us for, uh, for drinks and some, some food that will follow after this, but if, if Nicole, you could finish us up, that would be great. I'd particularly just like to thank the panel. Um, it's been a really stimulating conversation, but of course the audience as well. And Nicole, if you could say some final things. Um, look, I just think it's been a, a fantastic um, discussion this evening as well and looking forward to uh, continuing the conversation outside with some uh, nice glass of wine and a bit of food. So please stick around. Um, the course is, uh, really, this is the first time it's ever been done in New South Wales. So this is a university accredited course. This is a course with rigour. Um, it's, and it will actually create that peer-to-peer -peer networking opportunity for women in the local government sector that, um, you know, supported by ALBA and certainly supported by the Centre for Local Government. So it's a fantastic partnership. I have to absolutely acknowledge, um, you know, the wonderful contribution that ALBA New South Wales have made. This program would not happen without them. So your homework uh, as we, uh, we leave tonight is to go out and find those women and encourage them to, uh, to come and do the course and come and make a difference in local government. Thanks very much.